fortunate enough to have with us one who's going to talk about online writing. Thank you. Uh, can everybody hear me? If for some reason I start mumbling, it's not because I don't like you, so just let me know. If, if this is what you're expecting, then you're in the right place. If not, um, you know where to go, or maybe not. So my name is Mark Bloom. My company is Ray Access, and um, my uh, uh, Ray Access is a partnership. I have a partner, so we write, edit, and uh, deliver uh, website content, blog posts, press releases, online writing, basically. That's what we do. That's our niche. So I want to say right up front that if you have questions at any time, raise your hands and let me know, and I will answer them. You don't have to wait for the end, because I know, and if I'm going to cover it, I'll let you know, but I know that uh, sometimes you'll forget to ask, and I don't want that to happen. I'm going to cover a lot of ground today. So um, a little bit more about me. My background is uh, I was a technical writer for about 15 years, and I successfully escaped. My partner was a journalist for a lot of years, so our skills really cross well. We do a lot of, um, we've learned from each other. It's been a great experience. But my, uh, my family has a history of writers. Uh, I had an aunt who wrote a seminal epic piece about the, uh, the South, in fact, uh, but she wasn't very assertive, so her book was called Gone with the Breeze. <laughs> and then I had a great, great uh, grandfather who wrote the first book on a boy and his bicycle. It was called Huckleberry Schwinn. Uh, the rest of the, uh, the presentation will be based on fact. I'm, I promise you that. I had to get that in, yeah. <clears throat> OK, so this is what I hope to share with you today. Uh, we're going to talk about the purpose of online writing website content, blog posts. I'll, fo I'll focus more on blogging, but uh, feel free to ask any questions about the interplay between them. I'll talk a little bit about writing and writing tips, uh, talk about keywords and how to use them, some best practices regarding them, and a little bit about uh, plugins that'll help with publicity. So let me just state that my philosophy on online writing for business, uh, and I think there's some crossover for personal websites as well. The website, your website is where you're building trust with your readers, with any visitors that come. Uh, you're establishing your authority, you're connecting, you want to make that connection with whoever's there, and that's the place where, in certain pages at least, you want to try to sell your product or services. That's where when people get to a page where, uh, whether it's a store uh, or product page, you know, they're more interested in buying than somebody that just arrived on your home page. A blog, on the other hand, is a place to reach out. It's a place where you can explore different keywords that aren't on your home page, uh, aren't on your website, there's, there's um, they build up your website as far as content goes, which helps with your page rank. But most important, it's a way to reach out to attract visitors that normally wouldn't come to your website, because you can explore much different topics in your blog posts than you can on your website. <clears throat> so there's lots of things you can do with a blog. All of them should be to add value. You're educating, you're sharing, whatever it is you're, you want to do with your blog, you want to try to add value to that person's life that, that ended up somehow visiting your website or your blog post. Um, the one thing I will say is, well, I'll say a lot of things today, but your blog should be part of your website. It should be based in the same domain. If you're linking to a blog off in uh, blogosphere somewhere, that's not going to do you as much good as having your blog part of your website. Because when you're attracting people, you want them to be on your website. You want to be able to count that traffic if you're keeping analytics. 
There's a lot of good reasons for having your blog on your website. And of all of these things that you can do with your blog, the one thing that you shouldn't be doing is the bottom one. Um, the same with your social media posts. If you're trying to sell your product or services through Facebook, it's not probably or likely going to work. You, the, the idea of a blog is to bring people back to your website. So once they're there, they can look around and they can, uh, again, that's where you're connecting with them. So this is the question you should be asking yourself all the time. Not just at the beginning, not just today, but next week, always refining who you think your, your audience is. In any kind of writing, whether it's online writing, whether it's technical writing, whether it's journalism, whether it's uh, marketing, you always have to know who you're writing to. That defines what, lang what kind of language you use, um, how forcefully you can, you can push, how forcefully you can sell your stuff. Uh, this is the number one question. If you don't know this, the answer to this question for you, then it's worth spending time finding out because that's going to affect everything else you do on your blog and on your website. So always keep refining. Has anybody ever heard of the, um, uh, the term persona? Does anybody know what that is? A few nods. A persona is a identity of a sample user or, or even the ideal user. It doesn't even have to be the ideal user. But you build a persona to um, give yourself that person to look for. It, could, it, ha it should have a name, um, a gender, job, income, family, anything that you can uh, reasonably come up with that will define that person. A picture. And put all this information up on your wall and, and then Whenever you're writing, whenever you're writing, whatever you're writing, that's the person you're writing to. That's the person you are addressing when you write to you. And that's, that's a really powerful tool to help you write, but it's also really keyed in to who you're writing for. It's not going to be a real person. It's going to be a representative person, and you can have more than one. But personas are really useful for, for writing and for, for sales. So no matter who, you're writing to, make sure you know who it is. So the next question is, what value do you bring? I mean, what is it that you have to offer that only you can offer? That's another good question to ponder. There's um, competitive advantage is one way to approach this. So in my company, uh, we have two writers, two editors. That means everything we produce is, uh, both of us see it and edit it. My partner writes something, I'll edit it. If I write something, she'll edit it. That's a competitive advantage because most writers, especially in this town, are single, are single people. Not to put any, any of them down, there are some great writers. But I think my competitive advantage is that there's two of us. What's your competitive advantage? Think about that and how to work it into what you're writing and who you're writing to. So these are all things to keep in mind. Everybody with me still? Nobody's nodding off yet? All right, give me time. Anybody know what this stands for? World War II. <laughs> Almost. It's not the World War II uh, radio station, but... Uh, this is what your visitors are asking themselves when they come to your website or your blog. Most people think that your website is your st storefront or your corporate identity online that's going to be there 24-7 even when you're sleeping. And that's true to a certain extent. But your website has to connect with those people that are visiting. 
That's its purpose. Well, one of its purposes. Your blog posts should be doing the same thing. So the language that you use on your website and in your blogs should not be about me, 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 me. I can do this for you and I can do this and you should buy this thing and, and um, you should avoid that kind of language and focus more on your audience. If you buy this, you will benefit by this, by, by these things, you will get these things. There's lots of ways to go about this. It's, uh, it, but I think it's very important and it's a lot, uh, a lot of companies get it wrong. Your website and your blog posts should be outwardly focused, not um, about your company. Even though it's your website and it's about your, what you do, if you wanna connect with people, make it about them. And um, yeah, even your website will benefit from this kind of language. Okay, here's my favorite subject. And I can talk about writing forever, but I'm gonna try to narrow it down and focus on uh, just some things that I think will help. And again, if you have any questions, just let me know. Okay. Does everybody understand um, when I say rhetoric, what I mean by rhetoric? It's kind of an academic word that's not used very often. But when I refer to rhetoric, rhetoric, rhetoric is the use of language to persuade. So it's not sales, it's not, um, it's not narrative necessarily, but it's a way of speaking to people so that you influence them. Sort of like what I'm doing here today. I'm not trying to sell you anything. I'm not trying to get you to write the next great American novel, because one's been written already. Uh, but I want you to, I'm, I'm trying to get you to uh, understand the idea of the difference between online writing and writing for anything else. So that's, that's what I mean by rhetoric. Um, so all of these tips are useful and valuable and things that you should be doing for your blogs and for your website. Engaging writing is what will draw people in. That first line is what, okay, in any story, you know, that's the one that's, that makes you say, what's next? Your, your blog should be the same way. Start, there's a lot of tips for this. For example, you could start with a personal anecdote. Or you could start with an example. Um, we recently wrote a, a blog for a recruiting company and we started with an example of somebody that um, was looking for another position. So how does, that, how does the manager of that person react? What is it that they can do to keep that person in, in the company? And so that creates a situation where now you want to read more about how that's going to, how that's going to work. What's, what's the manager going to do? Or is it going to be ultimately successful or is it a failed experiment no matter what he does or she? <clears throat> so there are a lot of tricks to uh, um, engaging writing and I'm sure you know uh, a bunch of them as well. Again, writing for your the, the people that you're writing for. If you know who your audience is, you can write directly to them. Uh, find out like what they're interested in and that's a good topic. Uh, find out, well obviously if, if you have a website, if you have a website you know your business and you should be able to come up with a list of 10 questions about your business in, in less than five minutes that maybe the average person doesn't know. And those 10 questions are the basis for 10 excellent blog posts. If you're a realtor, how many questions are there about buying or selling a house that people have? Millions, well, maybe not millions, but hundreds. Uh, as a writer, there are a lot of tips that I share in, on our blog. 
So whatever your business is, that's topics for uh, blog posts. You want to answer questions. Even on your website, your website should answer questions, establish your authority in your industry, whatever it is, and share that expertise. Every business, every business has a personality. Think of the difference between an Apple website and um, a bank's website. I mean, there's a big difference, both in the language, the design, the, um, the way it's presented, right? So every, uh, whatever your personality is, whether you have a, a big company, whether it's just you, anything in between, put your personality in there. That's really important. That's another way of connecting with people. Um, right, long, right, short. What I mean by that, everybody, uh, I, I, maybe you haven't heard, but Google likes long content, long form content. So if you look at the top web pages, they're going to they're gonna have pages that are 1,500 to uh, 3,000 words. That's a lot of words. The reason I think Google likes it is because somebody who's reading that website is going to be spending more time on your, web, on your site, and that's something Google likes. But having a, having a page that's 1,000 words isn't by itself good content. It has to be, still has to be engaging. It still has to be informative. It still has to be interesting, something people are going to want to read. And I can show you tips about how you can take an article that, or a page that that's, that's that long and still have it engage uh, people just through formatting and simple tricks like that, as long as, it's, uh, as, long as the content is still good. Um, but not every page should, should be like that. Not every post should be 1,000 words. Uh, 500 words is usually fine for explaining something simple. A lot, a lot of it depends on the topic. Um, I, and I just heard a, a presentation yesterday where they were saying you could take a huge topic and break it up into a series, series of three or four blog posts, all related, part one, part two, part three. People are going to come back and read it. Um, and let me take, take an aside here for a minute. Do people actually read your posts? Do people actually read your website? Well, more likely to read your website, right? Because that's who you are. That's, that's what they, they're there to learn something about what you do or your services or what differentiates you between your competition, from your competition. But think about how you go online. What's your behavior? Do you go on and find a website and then read that whole page and then decide if you want to go on or not? No. I, don't, I don't do that. So people scan. And headings help. Um, bullets, formatting helps. And so does it matter that you write this carefully crafted article that you put your heart into and it's a thousand words and it, and it tells everything about what you do? Yes, it matters, still matters. Because number one, it's going to attract search engines. You know, if you're using keywords right, it's still going to be effective for your uh, placement, even if nobody else reads it. And if it's formatted right, people will scan until they find something that's interesting to them at that moment. So if someone's searching for the best chiropractor in town, they may come to a chiropractic website and they'll read a few things and decide, well, this isn't really what I want. This isn't, and then they'll go someplace else and they'll do the same thing until they find something that speaks, speaks directly to them. And that's probably the, uh, the chiropractor they'll go with. Uh, this happened to me just recently. I had some physical therapy that I had to have done. I was given a list by my doctor of uh, physical therapists in my area, 
Some of them were real close, some of them were far away. What I did was I went online and I looked for each one. I looked at each one and I ended up going with the one with, uh, that had the best website, that had the most informative stuff right there on their website. It seemed up to date, it was clear, and they did a great job, I gotta tell you. So, and I'll tell you their name later if you want it. But other websites didn't compare. They, they had blogs that were um, months or years old. Their, their homepage didn't say anything about what they did. So think about that in terms of your own website and your own blog posts. And I would say never ever try to sell on your blog. It's probably okay every once in a while to advertise a sale that's going on, but that's gonna be a very short-lived, useful blog. The best blog topics, as you probably know, I hope you know, are what we call evergreen. You've heard of evergreen, right? Tell me you've heard of evergreen, okay. So those blog posts are gonna be relevant for years to come, and they're still gonna bring value to your website uh, years after you've, you've uh, published them. So that's, that's the ideal blog post. Um, and if you haven't started, if you haven't started your blog or if you're, uh, you've stopped for a while and you wanna go back, the best way to start is shorter articles. Just start with some simple things, uh, pointed questions you know, that you can address with, um, with brevity, and I'll get into that a little bit too. <clears throat> All right, so let me show you an example of what I mean um, when I talk about formatting and lists. Oops, I, might, I guess I'll wait until uh, I get to that slide. So here's some, here's some tips. Uh, and these all work. When you have a, a blog post, instead of writing um, a bunch of things in a big paragraph that nobody's gonna read, break it up into, into bullets and numbered lists and know the difference between why you should have them. It's a very good practice and makes the whole article easier to read and digest and scan. Uh, for topics, you wanna, you wanna have a, um, a title that's gonna entice people to click on it and come to your, home, your, um, your blog or your website. So how-tos are very effective because that's what people are looking for often online. Um, numbered lists like the 10 best ways to um, uh, boil sausages. I don't know. Um, I hope nobody does boil sausages by the way. Uh, and, uh, and tips, you know, the 10 tips for, for um, networking. And even if you write a long post, make sure every word needs to be there. On your website, every page should have one focus. That's why those websites you see or used to see with, uh, that just had one page and if you clicked on a menu, it would zip you down to the bottom. Those don't work very well with uh, search engines because that page has no singular focus. It's all about whatever that company does, everything that company does, in fact. So each one of your pages should have a specific focus. Each one of your blog posts should have a specific focus based on whatever the topic is and um, whatever your keywords are using. And I'll, I'll get into keywords. We, I write, uh, and my partner writes this way as well, with direct language. We, we address the reader or the visitor with, you know, we say you all the time. We don't say the visitor is gonna be this or our customers do this. We say you, you're gonna be our customer, so that's who we address. And that's the, that's the best way to engage people. Um, if you're the type of business that has a person, an I, then, you know, then use that. Don't say Mike, you know, the company or Ray Excess is going to say, you know, 
like you were just talking to somebody. It's language that's very effective for connecting with people. And every, every web page, every web page, and every blog post should have a call to action at the bottom. This is very, or even scattered throughout, depending on how long it is. It's very, very important. You're writing, like I said, to persuade people. It's, rhetor it's rhetorical, rhetorical writing. So if you don't give them something to do, uh, you've wasted your opportunity. So always give them something to do, even if it's, you know, it doesn't have to be buy now. It could be um, get my ebook. It could be schedule an appointment. It could be uh, find out more. It could be any of those things. It could be a whole lot more. But always have an option to, to continue the conversation that you're having with them. Okay, so here's a good example. <clears throat> um, this is just one blog post. It um, gives you an idea. So the, the title has to be compelling. It has to be something that people want to know about. It has to be something that will show up when people type in a search term, like how can I be more effective networking? This will show up. <clears throat> Subheads throughout. We usually use two to three paragraphs between each subhead. No more than that. Uh, if, and if you only have one subhead, then you're, you're missing something because um, just like a, a list, you wouldn't have a list with just one thing in it. So each level of subheads, if you go to more levels, more power to you. I usually use just uh, the main title and then the one subhead level. But um, have, multiple, uh, have multiple ones. Make them so they're easy to understand. Those subheads are really important because that's what people are going to be scanning when they're looking down your, your blog post. Uh, you need a great opening line. Just like a novel, you want to get them to say, what's next? What do I do? You know, what's going to happen next? I use short paragraphs, nothing too long. A big, there's nothing worse online than a big block of text. It's very off-putting, even to people that read a lot. Uh, we've started using bolded phrases in each paragraph. You know, use your judgment. If you think it's too much, then don't put it in. But I think it helps people scan the content that you have, especially people that aren't going to just go through and read everything. And um, yeah, the other thing I've discovered recently Age makes a difference in the people that uh, you're trying to attract. So if your target audience are young, younger people, they will scan more often uh, everything that you put up there. But if your audience is an older audience, older than me even, <clears throat> they tend to read every word that you write. And they will read down the page, and then if there's a call to action, then they might follow through. But they will read every word. So Make sure you know who your audience is. It's very, very important. Um, graphical elements like uh, infographics, photos, um, graphics or GIFs or whatever you want to put in, it really helps break up the, uh, the text. But don't just throw anything in there. Make sure it's relevant to your content. Make sure it's tagged. Uh, I think it's alt tags that um, search engines can see. Search engines can't see photos, but they can read the alt tags. You can put your, um, you can put your keywords in there. But I would use, um, I would be subtle when it comes to that. But definitely, you need graphical elements. When you look at this page, you can see that it's pretty easy to scan. You get an idea of what it's about. When you're not sure, there's the, uh, the 60,000 foot or 10,000 foot um, test. Do you know what that is? Have you heard that? It's basically the sky level view. For example, if you were to take your printed out blog post and put it on the floor and stand on a step stool and look down on it, what's the things that jump out at your, in your eye? Is it the graphic? Is it the photo? Is it the heading? Is it, you know, you should be able to, those are the things that matter most. 
So those are the things you want to spend the most time on. Obviously, the content matters. And delivering on your promise, whatever your title is, is important. But the 10,000-foot the 10, view is, what's gonna, is what people are going to notice first. And if all you see is a big block of text when you're looking down at your blog post, no one's going to read that. Um, so this sort of summarizes the art and the science of blog writing. Blog writing is an art. Yes, it is. You have to be a good writer. You want to engage people. You want to persuade them to do whatever it is that you'd like them to do, whether it's uh, improve their posture or uh, buy a new chair. But there's a, there's a science to it, too, and this is part of that. The next part of that science is the dreaded keywords. How many people think keywords are a necessary evil? Okay, a few. Um, it is and it isn't because keywords work. Keywords have one purpose, and that's to get people to come to your page. That's all they have to do. And they connect with people because people are searching for certain terms. This is the, the way the internet works, right? So. I type in, how can I effectively network better? Or what's, what are some networking tips? And if I'm not using keywords, even if I have the best article out there on um, networking tips, nobody's going to find that, uh, that find, no one's going to find that blog post. So that doesn't help them. It doesn't help me, obviously. So using keywords is a way to get, a, get around this or, or, or use this system that we have in place called search engines. So I'm going to spend a little time talking about how to get the right keyword. And this is um, sometimes tricky. But the best way to think about it is what are people typing into search engines to find you or find your blog post? Is it? Um, the best, or, or is it uh, the closest chiropractor? Or is it the best chiropractor? Is it the best chiropractor in Asheville? So the big, key, the big keywords, meaning the short keywords, like if you were to type in writing in your um, search engine, you would get millions of hits, right? because everybody's talking about writing, including me. But what is it about writing that you want? How can you refine that? So um, writing is an example of a short tail keyword. Business writing in Asheville, that's an example of a long, -term key a long tail keyword. That's, that whole thing would be the keyword that you would use. Um, and this is something I learned from um, Chancer, is a short keyword, one that everybody knows, or you know, writing, the competition for this keyword is going to be immense, right? Because you're fighting millions of sites that have to do with writing. But if you have a longer keyword, like writing, business writing in Asheville, that's much more specific. There's going to be fewer people writing about that specific topic. Therefore, if someone types in that keyword, you might get a, a, a high listing, if not on the first page, if not first on the page, you know, right underneath it, because there's less competition for that particular keyword. Um, you also, um, but. But bear in mind, too, that there may be fewer people looking for um, business writing in Asheville. But those might be more targeted to your business. So all of these things play a role in figuring out which keywords you should use. When I talk about interest versus advantage, what I mean is the 
interest of the people doing the searching versus the advantage that you have that you offer them. So there's going to be, um, in this example, there's going to be a million people that are interested in writing. But there may only be a short, a short of, a, a fewer people that are interested in business writing in Asheville that you, can, that you have a specific expertise of, that you can reach those people. So does that make sense? OK, good. Everybody was still with me? I only see a few sleepers, so that's good. Um, okay, and blogs also, using keywords, you can use your blogs to attract a wider audience. So what do I mean by that? An example is, we used to have a, a gastroenterologist as a client that we would blog for every month. And I learned more about the digestive system than I ever wanted to know. <laughs> But he was, he was pretty savvy. So if you remember a few years ago, there was an outbreak of a virus, an intestinal virus on cruise ships. Does everybody remember that? And it made the news, and people were scared to go on cruise ships, and everybody was getting sick. It wasn't fatal, but it, was, you know, it took a couple days to get over. And if you're on a seven-day cruise, that's, that's your cruise. So um, this gastroenterologist had us write a blog post dealing specifically with this outbreak. It was news at the time, he posted it, and I'm sure he got lots of blog hits to his blog because people were searching for that particular uh, topic. That's a way to tap into uh, topical news. And it'll still be relevant years from now, but that was a good example. But you can also use your blog to, to hit keywords that aren't directly related to your business. Um, there, are, there are lots of examples of this, uh, and of course none of them come to mind at the moment. Um, oh, well, I'm a writer. We have on our blog post blogs about the holidays, when the holidays come around. So people searching for decorating ideas or the holidays or something may hit one of our blog posts. And our blog post may touch on um, decorating uh, your office or whatever, whatever we wrote about at the time. So they're going to come, they'll read the article and say, oh, that's interesting. And then they're on our website. So they may decide to look around. Everybody's, uh, everybody needs a writer and an, everybody needs an editor, whether they know it or not. So our business can come from anywhere. That, that tip, though, can really help you expand your views. And every time, I, um, every time we write an article like this, I can track the traffic, and it definitely goes up. Uh, here's just a takeoff on a very famous quote, um, which was the difference between the right word and the wrong, the right word and the almost right word. Uh, and Mark Twain was a genius at that. OK, so this just sort of exp shows you what I was talking about earlier. The more detailed you can make your keywords, the long tail keywords, they're the ones that are going to be most effective at getting at the people that you want to attract. A lot of people network, but not everybody networks in Asheville at WordCamp this year. So if those, that's the market you want to get at, then that's the keyword you should use. And always keep in mind what your audience is searching for. What is it that they are looking for that you can offer? And that's, those are the keywords that will attract them. So keywords play a role in helping people find your blog or your website. But they don't want to be hit over the head. Like I said before, your keywords have one purpose. And that's to bring people to your website or your blog. Once they're there, your keywords don't matter anymore. So make them invisible. People don't want to be, you know, keyword stuffing doesn't work because it's annoying. And Google knows that. <clears throat> your keywords should be invisibly placed in your, uh, in your 
your page or your blog. We write, um, we write our, our keywords in so that they appear naturally, they don't jump out at you, and, uh, and yet they're still effective. So uh, this, this is the industry standard. You can go a little more, a little, more, a little less, but that's what, that's what your target is. Everybody get that? If you, if you don't get anything else from this, this uh, session, I hope that's what you remember. So the next step, once you have your keyword and once you know that you want to put them in, you know, where exactly should you put them in, in your website, in your blog post? To make sure that they're uh, they're being used optimally by the search engines. And here's the list. Um, not, you can't put it in your title every time. Sometimes your title is uh, just twisted enough that it, you make it engaging. So if you do that, then put a subtitle in right beneath it that has the keyword in it. It's sort of like... Um, it's sort of like a tagline or um, to a movie or, or um, I don't know, a subtitle of a book, you know. Uh, Fear of flying, um, a woman's journey into the unknown or whatever it is. That explains what the book it is, is about compared to the title, which doesn't make any sense at all if you're a guy. So, um, sorry, I didn't get that, yeah. Good question. She said, do I create my keywords before or after I write my post? And the answer is, most of the time I use the keywords. I know the keywords before I start writing. Um, you can't, what you can do is write first and then you can add keywords later. It's a little more difficult to make them seamless, but uh, it can be done if you're a good writer. I always try to have the keywords in mind when I'm writing, so I know the direction I'm going, and I know what the topic is, so I know what I, what I need to cover. Um, so, so the 1% rule to the whole post? Yes. Yes. Um, the 1% rule ap applies to 1 through 5 here, because this is the part of the content that's going to be visible to people, right? So if you, if you have it in your type. I have a post that's 500 words, and I want five of them, there's a 1% rule. Right. Do they, does that just count against the 500 text, or does that 500 include from your title all the way to the end? It includes the title. Includes the title. Yep. So. When you think about that, five times isn't a lot. You're not using that keyword very much, five times. And if one's in the title and one's in the first paragraph and one's in the subhead and then one's in the last paragraph, that leaves one. And then just throw that one in somewhere else, in a paragraph, somewhere where you can fit it in. If you have a thousand word article, then use it 10 times. You'll be surprised, it's, it's not, you don't want it too much. I mean, too much is gonna be, it calls attention to itself. And that's not gonna be good for readers, human readers. They don't wanna be knocked over the head. Now, the meta description, if you are using WordPress and you have a plugin like um, Yoast SEO, SEO Yoast, whatever it is, or maybe it's even an all-in-one uh, SEO, you can you get a field where you can enter the meta description and the meta description is the little blurb that appears if your website comes up or your page comes up in google search engine uh, search page so there's your title which is clickable right and the little blurb underneath it which is 160 whatever it is characters i can't remember off the top of my head that's your meta description your keyword should appear in that and it should um 
just sum up what the article is about or the web page, whatever it is. All right. Um, everybody get that meta description? And the URL, you can modify, you can edit the URL. I mean, WordPress gives you a, uh, an automatic one, but usually you can edit it. And you should try to put your keyword in there. Basically, you want everything to match. You want the URL to match the purpose of, the, uh, of your article, which is reflected in your title, reflected in your content, and reflected in your meta description. It all points to the same thing. What's your page about? Should be no question about what your page is about. Um, another thing you can do, um, and this is something that's fairly new, Google has started doing it, is use synonyms. So you don't want to use your keyword more often than you need to, but you can throw in synonyms that help strengthen what your page is about. So instead of networking in Asheville at WordPress 2015, you know, play with those words, use synonyms to, to um, to mix it up, and it strengthens the, the content. It also helps the search engines. OK? All right, with a few, this is my, this is my least competent topic, but I'm going to cover what I know. Mm -hmm. I'm just warning you ahead of time. And these are just ideas. There's a lot of ways to market your blog post. You definitely have to market your blog post or your website. Um, and there, there are ways to do that. Find out, again, if you know your audience, where are they? Find out where they are and, and reach out to them, whether it's on Facebook, whether it's on LinkedIn, whether it's um, a, a Hangout, whatever it is. Um, guest blogging, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, uh, is another way of reaching out to your audience. When I talk about links, what I mean is links from your page or your blog back to other pages of your website and your blogs. That interlinking uh, is very valuable both for the user experience, because if you're talking about something but you have a page over here that explains it in greater detail, they'll want to know. And it's also good for search engine um, strength. You know, you're pumping up this page over here, which is really the page you want to you want people to go to. Everybody get that? The other thing, it used to be SEO talked about backlinks. And backlinks were um, this directory over here had a link back to your site. And it was really cool because even if nobody knew what this page, the site over here was, you know, that link was there and it counted toward your page rank. And, and so people created these directories that would contain nothing but bad, bogus, uh, Indian English, uh, but it had a link back to your site. Well, Google stopped that years ago. And it's really hard to get authoritative links back to your site. So if you were to, if, if you're a doctor and you want the Mayo Clinic to link back to your site, that's pretty hard to do. But you can link to Mayo Clinic and that still counts. Doesn't count maybe as much, but it does count. So if you have authoritative sites that you use for your research, definitely include those links in there. It helps the, the visitors because they're, they're saying, oh, you know, I can go here and learn some more. But always, when you link to an external website, open a new window, open a new tab. You never want to close your browser window because they may never find their way back. You want to make it as easy as possible for them to find their way back. Um, okay. So go find them where they are. Um, remember too that you can reuse, if you're a blogger, you can reuse that blog content any way you want. Create a Twitter uh, link tweet uh, or, or post. Go to, um, you know, go to Google Plus and, and type in a, um, a, a summary with a link, whatever. There's, uh, use it in ads. You know, that 
blog post that you put so much work into, you could probably pick out little bits and pieces that are valuable to people. Like if you have a list of 10 things, 10 ways to better uh, network at a, an event, you can use each one of those 10 as a separate Facebook post or whatever. And always, always put a link back to your site because that's where you want to drive traffic, back to your website, back to your blog, um, where the richness of you or your company is. That's where you want people to be. Everything else is just enticement. So here are a couple plugins. I use social. One question about that for you, Vincent. Yeah, uh, guest blogging, is that, is that sharing yep. a blogger's post? I'm going to get to that. Oh, okay. But good question. So I use social, which allows me to take my blog post, and when I publish it, it'll automatically publish to Facebook. And I can edit it before I publish it in Facebook. It gives me a window. I can, multi I can uh, publish it to multiple pages. Um, I think it allows me to do other social media as well. I'm sure it does, but I'm, I'm not a, a Twitter guy, so I don't do that. But check these out. And there are others. Um, I've heard, I heard about Buffer this morning. And Jetpack, I think, is the publicized. It has a publicized part to it. I'm not familiar with Jetpack, but uh, these just make it easier for you when you blog to throw your content out there. And <laughs> like I said, you've got to market it or it's, no one's going to find you. <clears throat> so as a professional, I have a LinkedIn account. And I belong to a number of relevant groups. Um, whether it's professional groups or writing groups or whatever. So when I publish a blog post, I can go to those groups on LinkedIn and I'll write a short blurb, uh, an introductory. Sometimes it's the first paragraph of the blog. Sometimes it's something just totally different. And then with a link back to the blog. And I do this for every group that I'm in. And that will generate traffic back to my website. Especially people, and the people that, are, that go to the website from those links are people that are interested in that topic. So that's a sort of a self-selecting group. That's good. Use all your resources. OK. Guest blogging. Guest blogging, by definition, is when you write an article <clears throat> for someone else's blog, or when somebody else writes a blog post for your blog. It's a way of reaching out to the community. And SEO, ultimately, is about building a community. It's, it's, about, it's not about tricking people into getting to your website. That's what it used to be. <laughs> now it's all about building a community. You want people, like-minded people, that are interested in what you do or what you have to offer. Uh, and SEO is just a way to get there. So. You're building relationships with others. That's a good thing. You're um, finding other people in your industry and sharing information. That's a good thing. You're giving back to your community by you know, providing this free information. That's a good thing. And each of your blogs, each of your guest blogs, allow you to um, put a link in there back to your website. And that's a good thing. So. Guest blogging is, uh, is the definite, um, it's definitely effective, especially if you're just starting out, because it gives you a wider audience or access to a wider audience. So I would uh, definitely recommend it. After you've built up your practice a little bit, you can reverse, you can reverse the trend and have people guest blog for you. So now you're too busy doing all your other stuff. Let somebody else take a week and, or a day or whatever it is, how often you frequent, frequently you, you blog. And that gives them those advantages. So I think I've bored you long enough. Um, I thank you for, um, yeah. Besides hiring 
Okay, that's good. Did everybody hear that? So, what's that? Comedy blogs. <laughs> yeah. Um, if it's personal, then definitely go for it. If it's for business, what I would recommend is find somebody that will edit it for you. And I don't mean your mom or your boyfriend or your, um, your roommate. I mean find somebody who's a professional or semi-professional writer or editor. Uh, and um, I, I, I used to work for Lark Books in town. So I, I have that editing experience and I love editing books. Um, I do it on the side just because I like it so much, working with an, editor, with, with an author. And the point I want to make is that a good editor not only will help you form a, an article and get the most out of that, but a good editor will also improve your skills uh, as a writer. So, you know, um, the, the, the language that you use and the, and the cadence that you develop, all these things are something that a good editor can help you develop. Um, but, you know, don't necessarily hire me for that. I mean, I will be glad to do it, but find somebody that will do it and do a good job on it. And you'll know, you should get feedback either uh, laughter or, you know, sales, depending on how effective you are. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. And yes, my company is Ray Access, and we do content writing, and we do editing. We'll edit for half price anything that you have. But uh, that's, this is not about that. This is about getting you <clears throat> better, more effective blogging and website content. Chancer. Yeah, um, yeah. I didn't talk about pitching, which is, I guess, part of the guest blogging process. It doesn't always have to be, but my feeling, especially here in Asheville, is that we're a community. So the other writers that are in town, um, they're not my competitors. They're my colleagues. So if I can help them and they can help me, then we all benefit. So if I decide to write a blog post about something that's going on in town and I refer to a person and maybe even put a link to their site about their perspective of it, I will, yes, contact that person and tell them that I'm doing it and, and let them know that that link is there and that's why they're you know, hopefully generating some traffic to their site. That's a, co a courtesy. Um, I don't expect anything after that. If they decide to reciprocate, that's fine, but that's not why I'm doing it. Sometimes I'll write blog posts that I call um, shout outs, which are, I'm, in, I'm surfing the internet and I find a really interesting article about something that I care about, which would be writing or, or uh, blogging, whatever. What I'll do is I will, um, I'll write a blog post about what I liked about the article I'll include an excerpt, which is never more than a couple paragraphs, usually less than that. And then to see the whole article, you know, here's the link. So that's a quick way for me to get a blog post up that maybe I don't have time to do, but it's also valuable to my readers because it's relevant con uh, content. 
And it's good for the person who wrote the original article because they get some traffic maybe out of it. Uh, but that's another way of, um, you know, uh, putting blogs together um, in a totally valid and totally um, effective. We good? Thank you very much for showing up. I appreciate it. I hope it was valuable. I have some cards on the table if you want to take one. And um, I will be at the wedge tonight if you're there.